There are many people who are convinced that the events of the past six months, the pandemic itself, the riots in American cities, have spelled the end of the gun control debate. Every month, new records are set for gun sales, ammunition is flying off the shelves, and leftist governors and mayors seemed intent on demonstrating that the old argument they used to make, that you don't need a weapon because the police are there to protect you, is actually untrue because what they've shown is that the police will not protect our property and our lives. And even if they have the capability to do it, they may not be allowed to protect our lives and property. So therefore, the gun control debate should be at an end. But what I'm arguing in this video is that it's not. If anything, it's going to get more intense because of what's happened during uh, the crisis over COVID. And I'm going to explain that in this video, and I'm going to give you six reasons why I think that idea that the gun control debate is over is just dead wrong. Reason number one, progressives always double down. One might think that they would back off given this situation, give up on trying to push more gun control legislation, undermining the Second Amendment, but that's not how they operate. They double down. They don't admit defeat. They don't admit that their ideas are wrong. They don't admit that the situation's changed. They double down. They double down and they double down again. And that's what I expect that they'll do with regard to this after the COVID thing passes, especially if they win in November. They will double down. The second reason I think we're headed for another push for gun control is that the groundwork has already been laid by the Centers for Disease Control. Now, this happened not just under Trump or not even under Obama. This goes back at least two parts of two decades. But the CDC has long identified gun violence as a health hazard, as a health risk. Moreover, and very importantly, it's also identified a racial component to that because an inordinate number, a disproportionate number of uh, minorities uh, are killed by gun violence. So you have these two key factors already in place with the CDC. Gun violence is a disease, and it involves an element that could be described as racist. The third reason are the precedents have been set during the current crisis, especially the crisis over COVID-19. Very important things have happened. We've seen state and local officials use a health emergency to wield draconian emergency powers against their own citizens, against businesses, against the people themselves. We've seen this. We've seen it happen. We see it every day on the news. We see it in our local communities. The fourth reason I think we're going to see a new push for gun control is that they will apply the lessons they've learned from the COVID situation and the use of emergency powers to the next time there's a crisis with guns. And you don't have to look hard for a possible emergency situation involving firearms. All you have to do is turn the news on on uh, Mondays and see what happened over the weekend in Chicago, Illinois, or some of the other cities across the country. There's always an emergency somewhere in some of these big urban areas with gun violence. You don't have to look for it. So the trigger that would allow them to pull in these emergency powers that they've already learned to use with COVID-19 and using against a health crisis and a racially tinged health crisis involving gun violence are all in place. The fifth reason I would point to, and again, this is drawn from the lessons they've learned during the COVID crisis, is the application of tactics developed to be used against supporters of the Second Amendment. What are some of these tactics that they could develop and employ? The first is just wait for a large scale shooting somewhere, a mass shooting event, and declare it an emergency, and then bring into play the emergency powers that they apparently have under their state constitutions. They could demand that people who own guns, registered guns, turn them in, surrender them to authorities in return for getting some sort of slip, acknowledging the fact that they've divested themselves of the weapons that they own. Now, you're probably thinking that would be unfair 
basically they would be disarming people who bought their guns legally and registered them, but they wouldn't be taking the guns off the street of the people who held illegal weapons. That clearly would be unfair. But look at what we've seen them do so far. If you protest an order from a governor in Michigan, you know, you can't hold the protest. In New York, if you wanted to uh, protest against some sort of lockdown, you're not allowed to. But if you're protesting some social justice cause, then you're allowed to protest. And you can go out there and not social distance and not wear masks. So as already, we see inequality in the treatment and the application of COVID restrictions to the population depending on politics. So I have no doubt that they would be unmoved by the idea that they have some sort of you know, uh, inequality going on here. They really don't care. Progressives don't care about that. Another very draconian thing they could do, and you might say, well, they'll never do that, but you know, I don't put anything past progressives from what we've seen in the past six months. If you own a registered weapon and you refuse to turn it in and you don't get the certificate saying you've turned it in and you're a business owner, then maybe they could forbid you from operating your business because you pose a public health risk a public health risk that has racial overtones to it. You're a racist. Or maybe you won't be able to be employed. If you go to get a job or you show up at work, you have to show them this certificate. And if you don't have one and you're on the list of registered gun owners, you can't work. Maybe you can't even go out in public. If you're caught on the street wandering around and you're a known gun owner and they, they have registrations to prove that, you know, you're subject to arrest. You're subject to being fined. You say, well, they would never do that. In some places they do it if you're not wearing a mask. You're not social distancing. There was actually a, a county in Florida, for a while at least, where you had to wear a mask all the time, even at home, even if you lived alone. If you lived alone in your apartment, you had to wear a mask. Now, of course, they don't know if you don't wear a mask, but in theory, they would have a right to bust in and arrest you if you're walking around in the house or maybe somebody saw you through the window and you don't have a mask on. This is absurd. They push this, these things to absurd levels. They've gone beyond normal limits. And I have no doubt that they could do it again because they love to control guns and disarm the American people. This is, after all, about power. And we have to keep that in mind. It's not about rights. It's about power. It's about rights for you. It's about power for them. Your rights stand in the way of their power. That's what, why the Second Amendment was designed to do just that. And that's why they want to get rid of it. One would think that if progressives at the state and local level pursued such policies, the Constitution would protect us. The Second Amendment would protect us. The courts would protect us. But look at the cases that have gone to the court over COVID-related emergency situations? Have the courts stood up for people's rights to express themselves, to post videos on YouTube about hydroxychloroquine, to protest in the streets against shutdowns, against the wearing of masks, closing churches? Occasionally, you'll see a court take a hard line toward these things. But the most time, the, the courts have folded, as they often do in national emergencies. They duck and cover. That's what the courts do, because they don't want to get into a direct challenge with executive authority, because they really have no power of their own without executive authority. That's why they back down. That's why they back away. That's why they run for cover. And I expect that the courts would do just that. Now, you may be thinking at this point, this is a vast conspiracy theory. I'm, I must be off my rocker. And maybe I am. But think about this. What if a year ago I had posted a video and I had warned about what was coming, what we've seen happen over the last six months? What if I had warned that local and state authorities would force you under penalties of some kind or another to wear a mask? to social distance? What if I had told you that they would forbid singing 
in church? What if I had warned you a year ago that they would prevent places of worship from operating? What if I warned you that they would allow masses of people to protest without masks and without social distance, but not allow 10 people to have a party? What if I told you that they would issue decrees in California explaining that you could sit on beach on the wet sand, but not on the dry sand? And what if I told you that the courts would do nothing about most of this and very, very rarely take a stand against these local executives wielding emergency powers. You would have thought I was nuts then. And yet, in the last six months, all those things have happened. Those are the reasons I'm concerned. I think everything's in place. All the pieces of the puzzle are there. The trigger is going to happen. It always does. And the precedents have been set. The courts will back down. All that has to happen is for Joe Biden to win the presidency and name Beto O'Rourke as the you know, gun control czar for the country. Everything else is in place. All the pieces are on the board. They just need that one last piece. And if they get it, I think the Second Amendment, despite what we've been seeing the last six months, is in big and deep trouble. And we got a hint of that last week when New York State went after the National Rifle Association. You can see they haven't given up on gun control. You know, they're showing their hand. You would think they would back off given the situation that they're in, but they don't. As I said before, progressives always double down. Or to use a poker analogy, they'll go all in. Even <laughs> if, it, if, it, if there's a possibility it'll wind up with a civil war. They will go all in. And as I said in another video earlier, we know that because they've done it before. They did it in 1860 and 1861. They went in all in to secure their political power. And they're willing to do it again. We've seen it happen in small scales in Seattle, Portland, and Minneapolis and other cities. So I'm really concerned about this. And I think it is a real possibility. I'd like to know what you think. You know, so please leave a comment. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends. Please subscribe to the channel. That's the best thing you can do to support the channel. And until the next time, I'm out of here.